All right, full disclosure before we begin, I have been in contact with the developer, but this is not directly sponsored, and Redbeak Studios and Orodev have no impact nor relation to the content or opinions in the video. So, with that out of the way, welcome to A Modest Analysis of Chambers of Devious Design, the series where I spend some time getting to know a game and then attempt to create an objective list of considerations on the UI, UX, gameplay mechanisms, and content of the game accompanied by a combination of suggestions and considerations of methods that could be used to change the game's experience in different ways. Not all suggestions I make will be complete concepts, nor will they necessarily be improvements, but many would be considerations of alternatives for similar games or games that could take some concepts and move them toward a different experience entirely. This is not intended as a criticism of Red Beat games, nor as a list of changes I would want to see implemented, but more so as a demonstration of my thoughts and experience in the game development space to potentially inform you of my approaches and thoughts as I develop my own solo indie projects. At the end of the day, I hope that Orodev creates his ideal version of the experience he intends. Now, with that out of the way, let's get into it. So, Chambers of Devious Design, uh, I've gone through the tutorial and I've poked around the campaign a little bit, and... I'll go ahead and jump in and show you what we have on offer here. So you start off with only one campaign available, and I'm not sure what the things here being unlocked would be, but apparently if I complete two can or win two campaign matches and then four campaign matches, something happens. Um, this this is not necessarily wrong or anything, but it, it is usually a good idea to give the players access to more information rather than less, because I don't know if this is alternative options for campaigns to make, you know, uh, future replayability stronger, or if it's abilities that will help you get further into the campaign, or really anything. I have no idea, and it is not explained. Uh, but it is well, you know, well established that after you finish this campaign, there are actually seven further campaigns. So that's very well communicated, and it's a, it's a nice artistic touch showing the silhouettes of each of the different, I guess, characters you play as. And having the tutorial button here as well as on the main menu is interesting. Um, it's not necessarily good, it's not necessarily bad, it's just a choice that was made that, I mean, it it is good to push people who might be struggling or having some confusion of how the game works to really consider looking through the tutorial. Um, the tutorial itself for this game is not incredibly strong, but I think I'll just do a, a modest analysis at some future point with several game tutorials to really go over what is and is not uh, you know, successful and what could be done differently for the different tutorials, but that's not really what we're here to talk about today. Today we're here to talk about the gameplay of Chambers of Devious des uh, Design, just on its own. Um, I think the last thing before I jump into it is the options here. Do have settings. Uh, really all I've done is I've turned off screen shake and lowered the volume for the recording. In part because, you know, screen shaking can sometimes give me a headache if it's too much. Um, and the music, obviously, I need low enough so that whenever I'm playing the game and talking, I don't get drowned out by the sound effects and music. So hopefully the volume levels are good. I already did a check real quick to make sure that the volume was not too high to drown me out. But it might be, you know, lower than what I expect if you're listening on a phone or something. So... Yep, if you can't hear the sound, that's that's why. Um, so yeah, the other thing I want to make note of is Orodev does have a YouTube channel where he goes over a lot of game development stuff, so I, my interactions with him have largely been as game developer to game developer rather than fan of game to game developer. Uh, but even though I initially bought the game to support his game development career, I didn't, like, dislike the idea. I just found a lot of the, the board games that I've played before that are similar to the gameplay, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. Um, I found them a lot of them boring and kind of 
lacking in depth. But with having spent some time in the game, I actually do enjoy it to a degree. It's it's definitely not something I'm going to play a lot of, but it is very much... Ooh, I can abandon to restart. Yeah, we're going to do that. Um, it, it is very much a more casual experience than a lot of what I like to play. And the base building, puzzly aspects of it don't appeal to me a whole lot, but it is definitely something I could see in the future sitting and, you know, having a conversation with somebody or, you know, drinking my morning coffee or whatever and just kind of playing a couple rounds of it just to relax and chill. And you'll see what I mean whenever I say it's a little puzzly. Uh, I'm, I'm going to sk skip all of the fluff because that's not what I'm here to discuss or talk about. But basically, the entire game is you start off with a little room that has a bunch of doors and you add other rooms to it. So for this first campaign mission thing, we have a 40 point objective and 13 turns to do it. So that means we're going to place 13 rooms or less to reach 40 points. The bonus goals are listed pretty clearly. If I place three garden rooms, I get this thing. If I place four economy rooms, I get this thing, etc., etc. Um, and before I start, I am going to actually do a quick commentary on the UI of the actual gameplay itself. The menus, very straightforward. You know, the, the art for the UI is perfectly fine. It just has a feel to it that I don't know if it completely matches the concept of the game, but at the same time, it's good it, it just it works it doesn't obscure information or make it hard to follow or anything uh i do not know how it would go for colorblind people since i have no colorblindness but uh i feel like the browns probably aren't terrible um i know like red green colorblindness browns can look off and merge with other colors i just don't remember which ones off the top of my head so, hopefully, the because I didn't see a colorblind mode or anything like that in the options. So, hopefully, these uh, colored names of the types of rooms are still visible to people who have, especially like the the red colorblindness where they can't see the red too well. In any case, uh, the the biggest thing that could be different here that I I don't know if it would be an improvement necessarily, but the way the eye bounces around the screen. So you have the play grid in the middle, and this is like the place where you're placing all the build uh, all the rooms. And then you have to go to the left to look at the available rooms and hover them so that the information pops up all the way across the screen. So your eyes are kind of going back and forth. You're hovering something, then you're reading, then you're hovering something, then you're so it's like a complete back and forth the entire width of the screen. Now, I'm playing windowed mode because, um, well, it's just, that's what started off as the default. The only thing I changed as far as like screen space is the resolution. I did increase it because I'm playing on a 4K monitor. So playing with a 1080p window was only like half my screen or a quarter of my screen. It was, it was half the width, half the height of my screen. So it made things a little too small to really understand and to really follow. So I had to bump up the resolution, but that's just, that's how resolution works. So if the different windows were laid out a little differently, it would allow the player's eyes to not have to jump back and forth nearly as much. So if the available rooms were, instead of being on the left, being across the bottom, and then the descriptions of the rooms were right next to it, it would be a much less of a phys like a physically moving your eyes back and forth and back and forth if you just, you know, were right next to each other and you just hover a room, look at it, hover a room, look at it, and just reduce the amount of effort it takes to fully understand what all you're looking at. Um, but the UI layout of panel on left, panel on right, gameplay and center is a very standard layout that does work for the majority of games. And even if it's not the optimal way of laying out the screen, it does still work for even a game like this, where you are looking back and forth and back and forth. 
it just it's a very clean and organized layout so again putting the available rooms on the bottom with the descriptions of the room next to it would definitely change the way your eyes move about the screen uh, the objective is fine in the top and this uh, character portrait with your current score is fine at the top but other than that the the biggest ui difference would be the art the ui the biggest ui change other than that that i would definitely consider if you're making a game is the text size i don't know if this changes much between the different resolutions um but at least in the larger resolution it the the words are kind of on the small side and it seems like the panel could be a little bit larger on the right side it doesn't quite reach all the way to the buttons the buttons could actually be moved over and it could take up the entire side of the screen from top to bottom, which would then allow the words to be larger. But uh, yeah, generally, like generally the larger the lettering that you can use, the better, especially for like people who have vision impairment to some degree or, you know, are very tired <laughs> because small letters tend to start blurring together as a person becomes fatigued or, you know, sleepy or drunk or whatever. Um, so other than that, the UI, again, it's a well laid out UI. It does what it needs to do and it doesn't do it the best it could, but it does it fine. So with that, let's start looking at the gameplay. Uh, each room has, first of all, a number in the middle, which is the score. Most of the rooms have some kind of symbol next to that number, which means if you place them next to an adjacent room of that type, for example, this room, if you look over on the right, says type entertainment, has the little music note symbol, but the little gear, I think it's, yeah, utility. So you get plus one score for each building of that type that it's adjacent to, so touching on the map. And that builds up your score. And then the completion effects, so... Some of them are, for example, the kitchen here. Your next room effect will activate an extra time. Some of them give points, and some of them give uh, perks and bonuses, I believe is what they're called. Um, I forget which is which. Oh, yeah, there's also abilities, but we'll get to that when we come across it. So each building has its own special function. Now, one thing I've noticed is whenever you're moving and deploying the buildings or the, I keep calling them those, the rooms, uh, the control decision that was made was if you click and drag, nothing happens at all. Click and drag does nothing. But if you click, you pick it up. And then you click to place it. But if you want to cancel and drop the room back, you can just right click and it goes back. So this is not a necessarily good or bad design, design decision. It's just a design decision that could use the consideration of if you have a choice, like a button or a unit or whatever, that you need to select to do a thing, this particular implementation style allows the player to start to select something, realize they are misclicking or realize that they're you know, hitting the wrong thing or just change their mind at the last second, drag off and release. So that way you don't have to worry about getting locked into a decision accidentally or, you know, once you realize that it's not the best decision. But whenever you can do something like clicking to select it and then clicking a different button to drop it, the click and drag is another input method that some people might find more intuitive and if there's no downside, like if you can click and drag and then let go without placing it and it drops back, it's, you know, arguable that it might be better to give the player the option to do it that way. Now, that, again, doesn't make the game better or worse. It's just a consideration of a different or additional input method that could be used. But very much the fact that you can pick it up and then drop it back without committing to it makes it so that the click and drag would be less of a liability and better as just an additional option for input. Now, with that being said, I'm going to click this, I'm going to drop it there, and that's my first turn, my first room that I've placed. Now, the reason I placed it there is because this took up two of the four doorways, which is, you know, 
helpful. So by completing the room, and completing the room consists of connecting every doorway in it properly, you'll see the little red X where I covered up a doorway without actually connecting it. If you have any of those on a room, at that point, you can no longer get the completion effect. So uh, we want to place this next to magic rooms. We have a magic room here, so let's go ahead and place it. And the cool thing, the, the thing that I noticed that, like I said, it has a lot more depth than I expected looking at the gameplay, looking at the development, looking at the screenshots, was you actually can rotate the rooms around and everything. And if you, for example, were to put this here, if you already have an available room that has those two doors right there in the corner next to each other, that can line up perfectly to complete the one room and get closer to completing the other. And you can just kind of plan ahead like, oh, if I grab this building, I can put it here. If you grab this building, you can put it here. And every building seems to be put on a sort of grid that you aren't shown, which is another design decision that, you know, there's different considerations to be made. So if you're playing a puzzly game like this, and I'll, I'll show you in a bit how it's more puzzly than anything else, um, is... Whenever you're working with any kind of grid, it is usually a good idea to let the players actually see the grid itself. So, for example, if I take this here and I'm wanting to place it, I have no way of knowing what will fit between it and the little blue square. If I want to put this building here, or this room, I keep calling it building, if I want to put this room here, the only way I'll know whether or not it will fit if I also put this room here is by guessing to a degree and hoping that I'm not misjudging the size of the room. Like I'm pretty sure it would not fit, not because left to right, left to, left to right on the grid, I I'm pretty sure it would fit because this is a very small, you know, takes up very little beyond the door. But that part that sticks out to the bottom... I'm pretty sure would impact and clip into this room. So that would not actually be a viable placement. But if I had a grid and I knew, okay, this is taking up three squares by three squares, it would be more obvious. Which, again, it's it's not unclear. Like, you can actually look and see, if I place this here, based on the size of the different rooms... You can tell this room is, you know, at the top two squares wide and two squares tall before it sticks out more. So you can make that connection. You can you can make that, you know, understanding or achieve that understanding without having to have a grid. But the option of turning a grid on or off is usually good to have just for players that maybe have more difficulty with spatial perceptions. Again, at least in a game like this where, you know, placement is fairly important. But now that I've spent a lot of time saying a lot of things, do I want to put this here? There are not currently any rooms that I could use to actually connect it if I do that. However, if I place it like this, that would allow me to put a room going to the left and a room going to the right to maybe complete this room without having to worry about finding a room that has two doors directly next to each other. So that's a thing I could do. If I were to do that, I would probably want to drop a room like this that snuggle that, that snuggles that uh snugly fits in there. So I think that would be fine. I think I will actually do that. So that gives me the bonus point for it being a magic room. I'm now one away from completing this room. And I think what I'll do, since this is a garden room and this room gets a bonus point for being a garden room, and it only has two doors instead of four, also because this room would block, this door would be guaranteed to be blocked. So if I put this here, I'm guaranteed to not be able to complete it. However, this one, if I put it here, I actually can complete it now. I am going to need a room that has two perfectly spaced doors here in order for it to work well. But that's fine. I can plan around it based on the 
next batch of rooms, which whenever you're down to the last room, it re-rolls into a new set of rooms. And getting, getting the different pieces to actually snugly fit together is actually very much a kind of relaxing, zinny kind of feel. But uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and drop this room here, which again, almost completes this room, but I just need another thing that I can drop right there, which neither of these rooms will work based on where the doors are and the shapes that are offered. So I think instead I will work towards this one and try to get a perk before the end of the eight turns that are left or before hitting 20 or 40 points. And you can see play just continues like that. Now it does get even more complex and interesting once other players are introduced because this can be a competitive multiplayer game beyond just the zen of building a single base. But again, we'll get to that in a moment. So I do not see any rooms that will actually meet both of these door requirements. However, I can drop this room here, potentially using this room next to it to complete that room as well as completing the next door of this room. But I don't really care about getting an extra turn. I'm, I'm fairly sure I'll be able to get the 40 points pretty easily in the next eight turns. So to demonstrate other things, I think I am going to try to focus on completing the room here, which that combination of this magic room next to this hallway room would complete both the activate the next room in extra time as well as the gain a random special ability. So I think I'm going to, just to demonstrate a couple of special abilities, I think I am actually going to use that exact combination. So there's that. So this fish icon, I don't know why it's a fish, but it works. The, the icons seem to be in the same mindset as, I don't know if you noticed any of the build or the room names, the, the room names seem to be primarily jokes, which the tone of a game is very much a design decision that is very open to like, even if I know I just ended the sentence uh, to, to clarify, even if you have a very serious, like dark aesthetic, it can be even funnier if you then use something like tongue in cheek naming conventions or something like that to actually like give the game more personality, which I'll talk about probably at the end of the video, uh, the aesthetics and the, the personality of the game. But for now, we're going to continue focusing on the gameplay. So this your next room activate an extra time is going to give us two special abilities whenever we complete this room. So it hits and then it hits again. So we see here hidden potential, activate the completion or placement effect of target room, as well as remove target unblocked door. This will contribute towards room completion. So I could actually just complete this room, period and then place something to complete this room and get another two special abilities. I could also just use this to complete the room and get another special ability, but it seems kind of silly to use a special ability to get another special ability. So what else can we use it for? Um, I don't really see anything that I would want to use it for. So instead, well, no, here we go. Um, I will demonstrate a perk. So whenever you choose a perk, this pops up. So these perks are all plus one score for whatever. This one is for uh, whatever. I don't I don't actually know what these symbols uh, Ah, OK. Hovering. Hovering helps your completed rooms, your hallway rooms and your rooms. So obviously this one is objectively the best. 
but they are randomly picked whenever you uh, get a perk, and you choose usually the one that's best for what you currently have. Um, and some perks are not just bonus points. Some do other things. But for this one, we're just obviously going to grab the plus eight points for free with no effort. Good times. And yeah, so you can see what I mean, I'm sure, by puzzly. Uh, it is very much like building a little jigsaw puzzle, and there is some enjoyment to that. Like I said, it's very, very chill feeling. Oh, we did it. Okay. So, moving on, the next one is going to have us against another opponent, and yeah, stars. Okay. So, as far as the gameplay goes, it gets much more complex once there's another player involved. Because now they can place things in such a way that you lose the ability to place rooms. And if at any point you are unable to legally place a room, for example, all of your doors are closed on the right and your opponent on the left has blocked you from being able to make any legal placements, from what I understand and from what I've seen, you just lose outright. So you can aggressively try to surround your enemy's little base thing or uh, I guess chambers. I don't know what the technical term for the actual whole structure of all the things is. But yeah, if you can actually aggressively surround their available doors and force them to not make a legal move, apparently they just lose. And I, I keep saying apparently because I don't have confirmation. I haven't seen anywhere in like the UI or anything where it would indicate, oh yeah, that's actually a thing that happens. It's just it happened to me at one point. I thought I was just going to lose turns until there was a viable, you know, room to pick. But no, you just, like, the game ended, even though he hadn't reached the number of points he needed yet. Now, it's not super easy to get in that situation, because I actually had to destroy a couple of my own rooms. I was I was just testing, like, friendly fire and stuff. Um, but I destroyed a few of my rooms that prevented me from expanding in the direction away from him. And that happened, so... Yes, I did many things for science in the couple hours I've messed with this game. We could totally just fit this in right here, but it wouldn't really prevent him from actually placing another another room there. Uh, we could also do this, actually, which would force him to place very specific shape. However, they, that shape does exist with the door in the correct place, so it wouldn't actually accomplish much, much of anything. Unless we take this room first, which I think I will. Okay, so now... So now we can try to prevent him from being able to make good use of one of his rooms by doing something like this. So now it's going to be much harder for him to use that particular doorway. Okay. This room is a type of sabotage room where you can directly attack, and this one as well, uh, where you can directly attack and try to destroy your opponent's rooms, or at the very least reduce their score. So if you destroy a room, and there's other rooms that are you know not directly connected to their starter room anymore, the rooms that are not connected still give the player points, but can no longer have rooms placed on them. So again, if you're able to prevent them from having a legal move by destroying a building and severing off whatever direction they're building in, you can just win that way. And this one is a lasery room. Unfortunately, there's no way I can place it that will actually impact him in any way. So I just have to kind of hope that he doesn't use it against me. Likewise, this is a this is a room that blows itself up in any adjacent enemy rooms. I don't have anywhere I can place that towards him, so that's fine. And then I have this room. It's a very big room, but it's an interesting room. However, the only place I'd be able to play it 
is right here like this, which would block one of the rooms and prevent its completion. I am very much interested in completing this room right now just to get that special ability. So this is the only room available that I can place there and still be able to complete this room. All right, so vandalism, deal one damage to target enemy room. That could potentially be useful. Oh yes, also the score that a room gives you is also its health. So doing one damage to an enemy room will not destroy any of his rooms. It'll just cost him one point. But that's fine. Now here, I could potentially actually place this. And again, the grid thing, um, I, I have no problem with spatial, you know, spatial awareness and things, but it would be very helpful for, I'm sure, a lot of people if there was a visible grid that could, for example, make sure that this room will fit in between there and this room, which I'm fairly certain it will, unless I am just completely <laughs> missing. Uh, also, you can hold them up to each other like this to see how it fits with the piece you're about to play. So like I said, it's not necessary that there be a grid, it's just a consideration that some play, you know, some developers might want to make. Um, but yeah, I think that is the most viable. I mean, I could also... Yeah, if I do this, it's going to hit my own room. You can see from the, the little laser sight there. So this is the best room I can choose. And so I will. And that completes it. So we get a, either a random perk a friendly neighbor effect or increase room score by three. So this this chamber would get up to four points, but that doesn't really matter because it's largely protected from him attacking it. So this uh, this this magic room with one health and one giving me one point is the most vulnerable. So being able to give it more points would be better than giving this chamber more points. Also, the adjacency, if it was over one more square and touching the starter room, having the magic room be destroyed would not stop the utility room from being connected. However, the corners do not work, so it's not a diagonal adjacency. I did a lot of experimentation. <laughs> what can I say? Um, so I don't care about increasing the room score by three, not really. I am behind by nine points, so that's a thing. Um, but gaining a random perk or activating a random friendly neighbor effect might be better. This one's gain a random special ability, and this one is activate the effect of a random friendly neighbor room. So it's basically 50-50. Either I get another special ability that I can use, or I get another, um, basically another random bonus, because this one would activate, and the only random friendly neighbor room would be the one that gives me a random bonus. So I think I'm going to actually do that. And it activates the special ability. Oh, that's nice. Okay, so the AI picked that room. I can no longer pick it. I was trying, I was going to try to destroy this by picking that after using both of these. Um, but he took that and pointed it, because if he had pointed it the other way, I'm pretty sure, based on the angle, it was going to hit his own room. So, I don't know if the AI is programmed to actually look at things like, oh, they can target me with the rooms that are available in the direction it shoots and everything, to actually go, hey, I need to take that from him. But that was actually a very good move on his part. This one, there's no way I can... Ooh, there is. I can do... If you destroy their starting room, does that just, like, end the game and win it for you? Although, one fun thing, this room is not going to be able to fit a large room. So if I destroy the starter room, best case scenario, he would have three doors left that he could put something on. But... If I also manage to sever this room in particular, then I might be able to prevent him from being able to place anything legally and we can see. So this is definitely really good. Deals five damage to neighbor enemy rooms, which would destroy the starter room. He would still have the, um, the room here where he could build towards my base that way. He would still have the room towards 
this base this way. But if, if I use the deal three damage on this room in particular, it now, at the end of the turn, should deactivate this room, meaning he can no longer place anything on it. Actually, I can also destroy that and then place this. Ah, is the starter room immune to damage? I see. Okay. Well, that complicates things a little bit. Not really complicates. It, it changes things a little bit, but it's fine. So we have more options here available. And I don't think either of these can be used to actually... I stand corrected. That one will do quite nicely. So... Deals one damage on impact, jumps to jumps up to three times to unaffected neighbor rooms. I mean, that's a thing. Yeah, so the starter room is completely immune to damage. All right. Good to know. So then, if we choose a random bonus after... Okay. Actually... Activate the effect of a random friendly neighbor room. So it's either going to zap again, which will destroy this room and give him very few viable options and disconnect those two rooms. So that would be good. Getting a random bonus would be good. And yeah, it would also set me up for getting another random bonus. Or would I rather have a special ability? They seem pretty strong, and it's also two points with only one extra. Ah, but there's no room available right now that could actually complete that. That's unfortunate. Also, it's now separated. That's also unfortunate. All right. Wait, didn't I complete the room? Oh, it gave me this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it triggered the gain of special ability. Double the score of target room. Uh, I'd rather get a... F Actually, wait. I know this is indestructible. It does work. Okay. I was just curious, so... I'm also now curious if damaging the room will bring it back down to five, or if it's just completely invulnerable. Hmm. In any case, so I have the door here, some doors here, and the door here. If I do something like that, then I can drop the doors, you know, I can drop the door to complete that, but I don't believe this has any kind of completion bonus. So the only reason to build off of this room now would be to try to reconnect to this room. Again, very much a puzzly game, and you can put as much or as little thought into it as you, you know, want. So if you do this, then obviously it'll be this door would be accessible by any room that has, you know, two adjacent corner rooms or corner doors that none of them have. So there is some pretty solid depth involved, but it's just, it's not incredibly my style of game. But that doesn't stop it from being a good game. Um, you don't have to like every game that's out there. So, I think... I think I would like to shoot my own starter room for science. How do I do that? Um, nope, that would hit that room. Okay, so I cannot at present. So I need something that I can build off of this room somehow to be able to shoot myself with this to see if the starter room is completely immune to damage or just can't drop below five. Um, if I grab this room and put it here, then I put this room there. So let me, let me see. Spatial awareness. It's about three squares down. Do, do, do. And it's not going to hit that room. No, it's not. 
So three squares down. So one, two, three, one square over. I think it works. So let's do that. All right. Now then. Yes, it does. Zap. Okay, so it, it is immune to damage completely. Also, yes, I just broke off like all these other rooms. This is, by the way, why I didn't get past this campaign level is because I was doing a lot of science. Self-sabotage is fun when you're learning stuff. Here we'd have two in the corner. Not ideal. This one will not fit, will not fit. Uh, nope, but it will fit like this. So let's go ahead and do that. All right. And now your next room effect will activate an extra time. That sounds pretty good. And it gets us pretty far away. So we have more space to work with. And the camera controls are, you know, wazd and scroll in, scroll out with the mouse wheel. Yeah, so I don't know if it's because I'm just on normal difficulty, but he does not seem to care about actually shooting me with the cannons and stuff. Which is a little strange. Um, yeah, sure, let's do that. Cool. And it activated twice, specifically because of the next room effect activating twice. I mean, heck, sure, let's... Nice. Very nice. Good times. But yeah, I'm actually catching up just because I'm destroying so much of his score. Um, I, I do kind of like the two-door two -door rooms. So we're going to do exactly that. I'm actually really curious also. So these rooms are now neighboring. Even though they don't share a door, they do actually, you know, they are adjacent to each other. So it is a random friendly room. And I'm curious if the activate the random friendly room can trigger the activate the random friendly room, which can trigger the act. Like, I'm curious if it goes back and forth. So I need a room to complete that. I don't think this one will work. Again, just trying to complete it for science, not because of anything, you know, optimal. Um, I mean, gain an extra turn could potentially let me pick two that will let me pick uh, something that will build off of something else. But again, only having two doors and also getting more score from it sounds good to me. All right, so next room effect actually triggers twice. That's interesting. And it looks like we do have a room here that will fit there. It'll be hard to build off of it. But there's no way I'm going to be able to complete any of the other rooms anyway. So let's see. Okay. Interesting. So I think what just happened is it triggered the your next room effect will activate an extra time, which then when the activate an extra time triggered, it triggered the activate an extra time. Like, I think that was just a weird, like, bounced around thing. But because of how it worked, we activated this with another one pending, which activated this, so that was once, then the second one activated twice, which means we got two special abilities. That's a pretty, like I said, there, there's a lot more depth than I initially gave it credit for based on what I saw in the development logs and what I saw on the Steam store page, which is cool. By the way, does this actually let me, no, it would only let me shoot myself. That's obviously a bad idea. Increase the score of neighbor rooms by one. So I assume if I pick a room that has a whole lot of neighbors, like this one, yep, plus four points, just like that. Nice. Your next three damage sources deal one extra damage. Hmm. Well, again, I can only shoot myself with this, so 
that's not great. Oh, also the abilities can apparently be pluses or plus pluses, and the plus pluses give plus two score for each of that type. That's cool. Um, yeah, let's let's try this activate friendly room, activate friendly room. Nope, it went the other way. Okay. Alright. So now, when I activate this, if I activate it with an activate friendly room, it'll trigger an activate friendly room. I'm really curious to see if it can bounce back and forth like that. So, let's... Do I want to build back? No, I don't want to build back. It activates that, it activates that. Act <laughs> okay. You can actually get multiple stacks of the next room will activate. That's so cool. But yeah, I don't know if it's impossible for it to bounce back or if I just haven't been getting the RNG I needed. But we're about to find out. There's literally no way to not activate to activate an activation of an activation. I hope that made sense. So. Wait, what? What? That's how that edge case works? All right, so just to be clear, we had the ability pre uh, prepped so that the next room would activate three times total. We activated the room that activates the effect of a random friendly neighbor room. It tried to activate the activate the effect of a random friendly neighbor room whose options were either the same thing or the same thing. But instead of bouncing back and forth potentially forever, or bouncing to bounce to bounce, it just didn't. So I don't know if that's a bug, or if that's actually an edge case that was specifically programmed to keep from having a soft lock. But... That is interesting. That is very interesting. Now, I'm not saying it's the wrong way to fix it, because that is an edge case that could, if it, if RNG was weird and there was no prevention of it, the ability for the ability to bounce back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until RNG decided to send it somewhere else, which then could bounce back and forth and back and forth. Like, that's potentially a way that a really bad soft lag soft lock could happen where there's just no way to continue playing. Especially if like all of your rooms are activate a random friendly neighbor. Very much an edge case, but that is one way of dealing with it where you just kill the process completely and say, yeah, no, you, you planned really poorly, you get nothing. But an alternative consideration could have been altering the RNG so that it's impossible for the activate the effect of a random friendly neighbor room to trigger and go back to the exact same room that just remotely activated. It, it would definitely take a lot more time and effort to get it working properly rather than just go, okay, it's messed up, kill it. Um, but that is one other way to be, you know, to deal with that situation. Another way would just be to in some way prevent two of those particular rooms from being placed next to each other. Um, that would be a lot more difficult even than the second option. But it's just another alternative to how to fix that particular strange use case. And that's, that's game development in a nutshell. Just... <laughs> Hey, there's this weird thing that happens. How do? I need to fix it. How? But yeah, so we now know that putting activate the effect of a randomly fr random friendly neighbor should never go next to another activate the effect of a randomly friendly neighbor unless we want a chance of the game literally just giving us nothing. So, the next three damage sources deal one extra damage, but there's no way I can really... Use this to attack him. Unless I get really lucky. But even then, the, the room's deactivated, so all it would do is cost him points. And yes, I'm absolutely going to lose. That's, you know, <laughs> for science. Um, 
I'm not trying to be good at the game. I'm trying to see how it works and what exactly I can, you know, gain as, you know, understanding from it. So, I think the puzzle is looking pretty awful, honestly. So we're just going to get four points real quick, close that off. Victory condition met. Game will end soon. So, because he went first, I now have one final turn to either destroy one of his rooms or damage one of his rooms so that he no longer has the 70 points, which does work, or to get more than 70 points myself with this one placement. Which is a very common board game um, type, or, or like, it, it's, it's a very common whenever... Let me rewind a minute. So, there is a common, you know, concept that is referred to as uh, first turn advantage. Most often it's referred to as that. Which is the default... Like, usually, the majority of games, having the ability to go first is just discreetly an advantage. Um, even, even in games such as chess that have been around for so incredibly long, whoever is playing and takes the, the first move sort of sets the pace, sets the tempo, sets, sets the way that the next several turns are going to play out, which then impacts the way the next several turns are going to play out, etc., etc. So having that first move in most games, whether it be because you have access to more, you know, resources or choices or whatever, the first turn advantage is something that always needs to be kept in mind during game development. And whenever you have a specific, like, back and forth, back and forth where you do have a larger number of choices if you go first, which the entire game, actually, because there was never a point where I was able to take two rooms and make it re-roll on my turn, Eddie here has actually gotten first choice of every single batch of rooms, which is a fairly significant advantage. So... That alone means that I am more likely to be behind and it's going to be more difficult for me to win as the second player. So the making sure that the both players have the same number of turns rather than just automatically ending the game when you know the player that went first reaches an objective is a an, it's an important thing for a lot of games, especially score or victory point based games, it's an important consideration that needs to be kept in mind. However, if there's nothing else that counteracts first turn advantage, the best thing you can do is try to plan the tempo of the game, the, the you know, choices that are made in the game to try to eliminate that first turn advantage. Actually, now that I think about it, has it always been five? Or is it just that I wasn't paying attention and the number of rooms is different each time it rerolls and it just happens to have been an even number of rooms, an even number of times, so that by the end of the game it was back to him picking first when these rooms were rolled. Or actually, was this a choice of six? Did I get first pick of this batch of rooms and there was just six and I'm misremembering? Wouldn't surprise me. I am on occasion a goldfish and especially if I'm focusing on something else at the moment. Details like that can very much be missed. So I will continue playing a bit further than I had planned on. If only to see. Yeah, defeat. All right. Retry match. So I'm just going to try to speed through and just get to the rooms re-rolling to see if there's a point where six rooms re-roll or just any even or, you know, even number. Uh, yeah, yeah, it started off with six. Is it always six, actually, now that I think about it? I didn't pay that much attention, honestly. I just saw... Huh. 
So yeah, that that is another way to deal with first turn advantage is uh sure. Um but that is a way to deal with first turn advantage is to have the consideration of okay, whoever picks first has an advantage, so let's make sure every time the number of rooms available re refreshes, it's always an even number. Ooh, that's actually an interest. So it is possible to play with up to four players in a single match. How does the turn advantage, because if you're playing with more than two players, it's not just first turn advantage. First player has the largest advantage. Second player has the second largest advantage, et cetera, et cetera. And the person who picks last or plays, takes their turn last, usually is at a disadvantage compared to all the other players. So is... Is the number of rooms generated each time randomized? Or is it legitimately that... Is it legitimately just that the... The gameplay is in favor of the first two players? Would it actually be in favor of the first two players? So working on the assumption that it's always six... It would be first pick, second pick, third pick, fourth pick. Fifth pick, recycle. First pick, second pick, third pick, fourth pick, fifth pick. Recycle. So no, it actually would cycle through as long as there was a number of rounds by the end of the game that was a multiple of however many players there were. I'd have to actually like sit down and think about the math for a second or the maths, if you'd like. Um, I'd have to, you know, consider for a bit to have a definitive answer. Oh, this actually completes the room completely. Okay. Um, but yeah, so if, if it is, I mean, even then that's not nearly as much of an advantage as just always having a higher priority pick for a new batch of rooms. It's just like, it, you can go very much down the rabbit hole of trying to eliminate first turn advantage. And sometimes you can find very, very little success with it. So, so far it has been six rooms every time. So let me just place as fast as I can to try to see how many rooms respawn each additional time. All right, another six. Okay. Oh, and the the perks. I don't think I I got a perk at any point during the last match. Um, the perks are basically like a room type gets a bonus for the rest of the game. So like the there's a little icon that'll pop up at the bottom of the available room list that shows a type of room, and they just get bonus points. I think just when you pick them. Can't say for sure. Um, but yeah, gain an extra turn is actually also more beneficial than... Well, I was about to say more beneficial than I gave it credit for, but actually it's just if you have a particular room that you would really, really like to, uh, to get... Yeah, there's no way to... No way to hit his room. All right. Um... Yeah, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> As I said, I am, on occasion, a goldfish. Um, but yes, the, the premise that you can make decisions and then, kind of like chess, look several turns ahead. Like, if I pick this and he doesn't pick this and I pick that and he, he picks that, then I can do this and, like... Based on the number of rooms that are in the pool still, you can make some fairly, you know, advanced or, or f you know, give a lot of forethought to your movement. So, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting puzzle game. I just personally am not a huge fan of puzzle games, but if that seems like it might be your jam, it, I can definitely say it does play well and it is very polished. And very much, uh, yeah, very much a potentially challenging game if you care enough to try to win. 
<laughs> but yeah, uh, let's see. What else is there that I need to talk about? Because this is this has absolutely been six every single time. Six rooms, six rooms, six rooms. Um, so let's actually exit out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go into a custom game and let's have whatever. Uh, let's have four players and let's see how many rooms populate in pool. Six. So there we go. It's always six. Block it like that. Nice. So the, the green player is very much getting bottled in in that corner. Um... Oh, I was about to say, I need to block off that direction so that I don't get swarmed. That is a viable way of doing it. But it also takes up a lot of space. So, is this? No, this does not fit. Yeah, this is definitely the only way to do it. All right, so he should not be able to build in that direction. So I'm hoping to be able to show the destruction or the, the player losing. That's actually probably a bad thing, actually, if, if it works the way I think it does. Where not having the ability to move or to place something successfully actually causes you to lose. All right, so it's my turn. Ooh, I could actually potentially destroy my own room to make more space. That's interesting. But I am very limited on decisions here. This is terrible. Absolutely terrible. But, okay, now he's able to place rooms again, so, yeah. We're not going to get a test of it. Unless I am unable to place a room. So, no, I can. I very much can. Sure. Victory condition met, so everyone else gets one more turn. And then that's the end. But yeah, you see the, the ZZZZ? I think that means she couldn't place any more rooms. Yeah, rooms placed 8, 7, 8, and then that one was the one that actually um, got the multiple turns in a row. So she was no longer able to place, the red player was no longer able to place any rooms. So that's what the ZZZ was. She got knocked out. Cool. The normal AI placed a room that gave him one additional score compared to mine. So he actually ended up winning. Neat. But yeah, so ketchup, ketchup mechanics and being aware of first turn advantage are quite important. Um, but there's, a, there's so many different ways to address both of those concerns. And it really is on a game-by-game -game basis. Now, I said I was going to talk about something. Ah, oh, right, right. Aesthetics. Aesthetics. So, it is actually very much worth noting that the developer, uh, Orodev, uh, has these unique character designs. And... Most of them are just, it seems like, uh, a small number of different poses. So very much like uh, stop motion slash uh, visual novel slash... Like, there's a lot of stuff that uses that style of animation. Uh, so it's able to portray, like, you know, the concept of these motions without actually having to go through and have the you know, 30 frames per second of 2D animation or go through and actually do a full 3D model and render out animations and all that. But the important note, the most important note, is that 
this entire game appears to have like art made specifically for this game. You'll you'll see a lot of games, especially on Steam, uh, that have no distinguishing, dis, you know, discernible uniqueness to their visual style. And that's actually a fairly major problem. Um, there's nothing wrong with using free or purchased assets, especially as a solo developer. It's it's very easy to fall into the trap of just paying for all of the assets from an asset store that you can't make yourself or do yourself. The problem is, and I, I just actually got done having a couple of conversations in the last week alone uh, with some people, the problem is it creates this illusion that your game is of lower quality, is is completely bland and looks completely like every other game using those same assets. So Unreal assets have that Unreal look, for example. So any game made in Unreal that primarily just uses those Unreal assets kind of just look like all the other games that use those assets. Um, and it really does take attention and conscientious, you know, uh, decision making to decide where to invest your time and slash or money to try to create a more unique or more, you know, uh, a visual style aesthetic or whatever that will stand out from other people's games other games in general and especially if your game looks and feels the exact same as another game but that game has better reviews or whatever you're likely to be in direct competition with a game that might not have anything actually in common with your game just because of a very similar visual style or having used very similar assets so that is, that is definitely a consideration whenever you're choosing your visual style and what you're going to do for the visual information and whatnot that the player is interacting with. And I believe... Oh yeah, right, right. I was going to say the special rules here. This is why the room effects trigger an extra time and stuff. Like, I just was messed around looking at some of these whenever I was testing before. And yeah, there's there's a lot of like customization. You can you can literally just do a uh, solo play, single player with 300 victory points and, you know, 50 turn limit and just sit here and build and build and build and just play it like literally like a jigsaw puzzle to just see like how tightly you can build it or how how well you can complete the different rooms and all that. But this is absolutely uh, much more, in my opinion, uh, a puzzle game than a tactical game. But it has a ton more depth than it appears to by just looking at the, the screenshots and things. So, I guess, I guess technically you could consider a modest analysis videos to be sort of reviews from the game development perspective but hmm. hmm yeah also it's i believe if i remember correctly it's on sale uh i did buy just as i said at the beginning i i am not this is not sponsored in any way i did buy this game rather than having it you know a key given to me or whatever but uh yeah so i think it is discounted right now I don't, I don't remember exactly what I paid for it, but yeah, that I think does it. And that has been a modest analysis of Chambers of Devious Design. I hope you enjoyed it and until next time, have a good one.